big pharma um, has very close ties with the psychiatry industry. Over 50% of them had financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry. Pharma has a great impact on what doctors learn, what psychiatrists learn in medical school. And you believe this is a major disservice to our youth? I think it is, yes. When there are other ways of handling it, it's especially um, a disservice to less privileged youth because um, Medicaid only pays for psychiatry and medication. Medicaid does not pay for family therapy or individual therapy for the child. So right there, it, it's a great disservice that less privileged children are drugged, medicated, when there may be other solutions to their problem. We have Dr. Marilyn Wedge with us today. Dr. Wedge, thank you for coming in studio today. Oh, thank you for having me here. Yeah. I want to read a quote to you that says, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. That was Nelson Mandela. And we want to thank you for bringing mainstream psychology into the world of a subject that they're not too hip on called virtual autism. Yeah, virtual autism um, interested me because I looked at the numbers. In 1970, one child in 10,000 was diagnosed with autism. Well, in, today, it's one child in 36. So imagine what that means. In a classroom of 36 children, one child has been or will be diagnosed with autism. And that is shocking to me. So I began to look into this. and. Um, it, it started with a friend of mine who's a professor at Cornell University. My, my story, my experience started um, in about 2000. He had a, um, a two-year-old son who was normally developing. By the age of two and a half, his son was diagnosed with autism. He didn't know why this happened. Um, and so we began to look at the f environmental factors. First, he and his wife had a new baby a few months previous, and they, uh, they had lined up some babysitting for their older son, but that fell through. So they resorted to the electronic babysitter. That was his words. He, the, his son was watching three, four hours of television every day. Good, good program, Sesame Street, other good programs. But, um, he wondered if the, the watching television had something to do with the diagnosis of autism, because that's really the only thing that changed since the child had been developing normally. So he um, took away all screens from his child, didn't, didn't let him watch TV or uh, be on the computer or anything else. He interacted, he um, ramped up the, his social interaction with his son, took him to the beach, took him to the playground, uh, played games with him, read to him. And by age six, his son no longer had symptoms of autism. His, his son was cured. Um, so he went on to write a, uh, to, to do a research study in um, the state of Washington. He looked at the state of Washington. The eastern part gets um, less, not very much rain. The western part gets a lot of rain. And so he looked at the uh, rate of autism among, among children in both parts of Washington. And what he found, he and a colleague found, was that the autism rates in the western part of Washington were higher because the children watched television more or played on tablets and computer games more. Well, he, uh, this research was in a peer-reviewed study and he took his research to the psychiatric community and he was met with a brick wall. They, they simply did not accept his hypothesis. They didn't accept his study. They didn't accept his story. Meanwhile, in Europe, um, researchers were starting to research something which uh, the, the word virtual autism was coined in Romania by Dr. Zamfir, a psychologist. 
Um, and he found uh, that in his psychiatric hospital for children, uh, children who were diagnosed with autism had a much higher exposure to elect uh, television than other children. So he did an experiment by taking away uh, all television, all screens from the children that were diagnosed with autism, and a good portion of them got better. Now that's not to say that some children didn't have what we call classical autism, because autism ex existed before screens. But a certain proportion of the kids got better when screens were withdrawn. So today in Romania, uh, children under two years old are not allowed to watch television or you see other screens. Um, then there was the f two French psychiatrists um, began to notice this same phenomenon. One psychiatrist found that when a child, a four-year-old with uh, diagnosed with autism, went home to North Africa and had no screens for a month, he came back without the symptoms of autism. Uh, studies were done in um, Thailand, in Iran, in Japan, and in China, all finding the same thing, that autism could be triggered by en environmental factors such as electronic screens, tablets, computers, television sets, video game players, smartphones. Um, so this research is not well accepted. It's, it's not being done in the United States. And I, I want our audience to know these are peer reviewed studies. These aren't anecdotal, you know, studies. And for whatever reason, the American Psychology Association hasn't really uh, acknowledged this phenomena. No, they haven't. Um, and there's been quite a pushback among parents um, whose children had been diagnosed as autism and they're raising their children as having autism. And they find it difficult to believe that if they had taken away screens, um, that maybe their children would have developed more normally. So it's very difficult for these parents to accept. Have psychologists such as yourself that are going against the grain, have they come up with an age limit where it's okay to introduce screens to children, digital screens and tablets? Well, Is there I'll a tell cutoff? You, I'll, I'll tell you what the, um, the World Health Organization recommends that babies under one year old have no screens exposure at all. The American Pediatric Association has said, has recommended that children under the age of two not have any exposure to screens, and that after two, they have only one hour a day of quality uh, screen time. But of course, if you look at around you, that's not what children today are doing. I mean, children have their own smartphones, uh, they have their tablets. Tablets are made for children as young as six months old. Uh, so most parents aren't aware that autism can be avoided, prevented in many cases, I'm not saying all, in many cases by not exposing young children to screens. Right. And Dr. Wedge, I, I hope that we could get this message out to as many people as possible. If you're listening at home, please do not put tablets in front of your young children. You're seeing a direct peer reviewed study from several different regions in the world where this is causing virtual autism in our children. And we need to stop this now. And, and I want to thank you for your, your work, Doc, and, and bringing the awareness to the world about this very serious subject. And a whole industry has been built around over diagnosing these children and providing them amphetamine salts, Prozac, Ritalin, Adderall, etc. And you believe this is a major injustice that's occurring in our society. I do, because um, often medication is the first resort, and there are other ways of helping these children um, with family therapy. So, for, for example, for um, children to have consistent discipline, I mentioned before, consistent discipline, for parents not to fight or argue in front of their children. Um, domestic violence is another cause of behaviors that look like ADHD. Trauma, childhood trauma can produce uh, hyperactivity and ADHD type behaviors. 
So if you look at the family environment, there's so much that can be changed um, and, and the child ends up never needing medication. And if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, meaning it's their first knee-jerk reaction to diagnose the ADHD and therein subscribe medication to combat it. It's what they learn in medical school. It's what they learn in their residency as psychiatrists. Um, and so, of course, they do what they've learned in, in medical school. And you believe this is a major disservice to our youth? I think it is, yes. When there are other m ways of handling it, it's especially um, a disservice to less privileged youth because um, Medicaid only pays for psychiatry and medication. Medicaid does not pay for family therapy or individual therapy for the child. So right there, it, it's a great disservice that less privileged children are drugged, medicated, when there may be other solutions to their problem. And if you and I were to follow the money, we would, we would probably end up at the doorstep of big pharma that is making uh, gazillions of dollars by promoting uh, psychiatrists to push this medication forward to our children. Unfortunately, that's correct. Uh, unfortunately, Big Pharma um, has very close ties with the psychiatry industry. Um, the authors of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, um, there was one study done, peer-reviewed study done, um, that over 50% of them had financial ties to the pharmaceutical industry. Um, it, it's what, it, pharma has a great impact on what doctors learn, what psychiatrists learn in medical school and um, how they're treated after medical school. They're, they're given um, speaking engagements uh, by pharma. Uh, they're given vacations and high paid uh, high paid speaking engagements. So yeah, I, I think following the money. The lobby for, for Big Pharma is done very clandestine, meaning it's not an envelope of cash handed under a desk. No. It's, hey, why don't you keynote speak over here in Colorado and we'll fly your family out and we'll take care of everything. And oh, by the way, this is a new, um, amphetamine that you can prescribe to children so it's done very um uh it's done in the shadows and and it's a shame and and i want to thank you for bringing light to this subject unfortunately mainstream psychology and the academia or intelligentsia of the psychology world believes that you're on the fringe of it and you're not really getting the mainstream acceptance because you're bumping the apple cart well that's true um, that's true, but I think with more light on the subject, uh, for example, I'm involved in making a film called A Stone Unturned, which is about autism, virtual autism or environmentally triggered aut autism. I think that will be um, you know, one source of light on the subject. I think this interview will be important if people hear it, um, but virtual autism is real and removing screens. I, I mean, you just have to look at the American Pediatric Association, the World Health Organization. They all recommend, they, I mean, these are really first-rate institutions. They recommend that um, young children not be exposed to electronic screens. And I want our audience to know the data behind this. The autism rate among children has risen from one in 10,000 in 1970 to one in 36 in 2023. That's an extraordinary. Well, if you think about how the um, electronics industry has grown, I mean, when I was a kid, we had one television, that was the only screen. And now the average American household has uh, seven screens, you know, with uh, computers, tablets, smartphones. I counted up our screens with just my husband and myself. We have nine screens in the house. Right. And, and you almost feel naked without your cell phone now. Exactly. And kids, they, they see their parents on cell phones all the time. They want to have a cell phone. So children um, at young ages are getting cell phones and they're glued to them.
you and I had a conversation with one of our producers who has two young daughters and his parenting technique is to give them tablet time only for a specific hour per day. Is that something you recommend to parents that are watching on in terms of the limitation of if they're older than three, if it, between two and three, it, it, you have to monitor carefully what they're watching, but it could be reasonable to give them one hour of tablet time. You, you talked about a study that involved um, a swath of children. Um, one watched SpongeBob, one group watched another programming, and then the third. Oh, yeah. Can you go into that study a little bit? Yeah, that was Dr. Christakis' study in, at the University of Washington. So, yeah, one group of children watched um, public television, one group watched uh, commercial cartoons, and one group didn't watch anything. And uh, they watched 20 minutes of each. And after that, they were given little tests, testing their cognition, attention, attention span, memory. And the children who watched um, public television or no television, they scored higher in in those sub in those subjects than the children who watched fast paced cartoons and Dr. Christakis um, concluded that it was the fast pace the unnatural pace of the cartoons that were kind of boggling to the child's mind, right? And and made him lose attention. Let's talk a little bit more about the physiological aspects, more more specifically diet and some of the food dyes that have been put in our food system, some of the GMO stuff. Are you seeing direct correlation between the American diet and autism or ADHD? I can't speak to autism, um, but yeah, there there are studies. Um, there was a huge study in England called the Southampton study and what it was focusing on were uh, artificial colorings, uh, food dyes that were put into um, food. And it was a large study. And what they found was artificial food colorings and uh, preservatives caused hyperactivity in uh, the children, in, in a large percentage of the children who, who were taking them. And it was such a um, striking study that the European th Food Authority told the food companies that they would have to label their foods uh, with uh, food dye. The, the food, these foods have been shown to cause hyperactivity in children because they contain artificial food colorings. And the food companies in Europe decided to uh, take out all the artificial dyes and started using natural dyes like sweet potatoes, beets, saffron, so if you buy um, a, uh, a package of M&Ms in London and you buy a package of M&Ms here in Los Angeles, they have different ingredients. They're made by the same company, but they have different ingredients. The ones in Los Angeles still have the artificial food colorings because the United States hasn't agreed with that study or the food lobby hasn't, um, hasn't changed their policies on labeling. And that's why you're seeing these giant numbers that are really yeah. alarming. Growing up, we were just hyperactive, but they want to diagnose ADHD because there's a big there's a big uh, dollar sign behind that diagnosis, and uh, it's sad. Well, you know, I think it's what they learn in medical school. You know, they learn that ADHD is a disease, and I think many psychiatrists are are very well intentioned. Um, but they, they learn what they learn in medical school, um, which is influenced by the pharmaceutical lobbies. And, um, and so the, they do their best, but this is a fast way to control the kid's behavior. But can you agree there's no biomarker to diagnose ADHD? Well, it's not, not a matter of my agreement. There is no biomarker for ADHD. So it's an arbitrary call by a gentleman who, or, or woman who's influenced perhaps by money. I don't like to think that, but um, it, it, they're influenced by their education in medical school. And certainly um, they, they do make a lot of money out of diagnosing children. So doc, to recap, how we can help lower the numbers of virtual autism in our children is to limit the screen time. Yes. 
be more actively involved in the parenting? Yes, especially that. That's the other piece of it. It's not just eliminating the screens, but it's becoming act active as a parent, play, um, reading to the children, singing songs with the children, taking them to the playground, especially between the ages of zero and 30 months. Um, that's when the brain is, is forming its synapses, it's wiring itself, and in order to wire itself normally, it needs social interaction. Um, a lot of social interaction, especially with the parents. What are some signs that you can identify, some, some signs in children that may be becoming virtually autistic? Well, you look for, has your child been exposed to screens more than, more than one hour a day? Or has your child been exposed to four or five hours of screens? Um, but the signs would be um, introverted, um, being obsessed with one object, like pushing buttons, not making eye contact, not socially interacting normally. Uh, those are some of the signs. And if you see that in kids, I mean, the best thing is to remove all screens from the house. Just take them away. If you have to be, use your cell phone, do it in a place where, um, where your child can't see you. Because it, it's, it's a simple solution that will change your child's whole life. And then to the parents that have a hyperactive kid, a kid that, you know, has what some people call like separation anxiety. When mom leaves, they freak out or dad leaves. What is your advice to those parents on how to parent that child? Well, you want that child to have what's called a secure attachment. So you give that child a lot of attention um, and make sure that the, the school that you're dropping them off or the daycare you're dropping them off at is a good nurturing environment, is a place where they're welcoming the child and they'll make the child feel safe and secure. Okay. And I know there's no manual for parenting. It's a very tough job. And uh, But what is your philosophy on spanking? Well, well, spanking is considered child abuse. I, I know it wasn't in previous decades, but today, and it doesn't work. Um, parents who have spanked their child tell me it just doesn't work. What works is clear limits, clear consequences. Every time, the same consequence. Give us an example of a healthy, constructive consequence if a child is misbehaving. Well, for a very young child, it's a time out in their room or a time out in the corner of, of the living room. I mean, I, I, I was made to sit in the corner of the classroom if I chatted too much with my neighbor. I had to sit in the corner for 10 minutes and that kind of cured me of it. I didn't really like that. It was embarrassing. So I think a timeout, a loss of um, TV privileges. If they watch an hour of TV, they, they can lose that. Uh, loss of playtime uh, with their friends for, for one day. Um, just something that you can enforce. Don't say to your child, you're grounded for a week because that's very difficult to enforce and you probably won't enforce it. So just something that you can enforce right away and also reward good behavior. That if the child doesn't act out and has a good day at school, say, oh, you had a good day at school. Well, we're gonna go to the park today and, and celebrate that. You know, the French have a very unique parenting style where they let their children climb on tables and just kind of free roam. What are your thoughts about creating no boundaries for children where they could just kind of roam at will, pick up what they want. Is that, does that work or does that end up backfiring? Well, I don't know. When I was a child um, in Miami Beach, I roamed at will. I, I knew the parameters. I knew the neighborhood and I roamed at will and felt very free. And I think it helped me develop a, a sense of self, a sense of security. Um, I think children who are scheduled, over scheduled too much, um, really suffer the consequences. They don't, they don't get to use their imagination and, and create toys. I created a, a fishing rod out of a bamboo pole and fished in the creek near my house. You know, it was a creative experience. Right, no, that's, that's a neat uh, story because it seems like we're sapping creativity by just putting a tablet in front of children and then they're watching things that might be questionable, but that's a whole other story. 
but really your focus is limiting the screen time for children. You're seeing direct peer-reviewed studies and correlations between overstimulation with electronic devices and autism, and it's scary. It's very frightening what's happening. Well, it is, yes. Yeah. When you speak to those children, do you have a, a technique in which you speak to them? Are you very stern with them or are you, oh, no. you're super understanding? Well, I'm super, but I don't really, I don't usually treat the children very much. I, I mostly work with the parents. I mean, I, I kind of get a, maybe see the child in the first session and get a clue as to what's going on. And then once the child, the child is kind of my co-therapist and they give me a clue as to what's going on in the family. Like, oh, daddy's been sick, or mommy and daddy are not getting along, mommy and daddy are having arguments, or my daddy hates my grandma. And though then I can go work with the parents and not make the child feel like they're a patient and help the parents change that environment. So you get the cues from the children. They'll tell you what's going on. Oh, they'll on. tell me what's, yeah. oh, they'll always tell me what's going on. I mean, sometimes I'll play a game with them, um, if you'd like one, one example, uh, this lovely little boy, um, five years old, and he had a personality change overnight, and his, his classroom teacher di didn't know what was going on. Um, he seemed to have ADHD overnight. And so I, he, the pediatrician, the parents took him to the pediatrician, and the pediatrician said, well, I don't believe in giving drugs to a five-year-old boy, so why don't you go to um, a family therapist? And so they did, and I, um, I talked to the parents, lovely parents, and the father was wearing a cast. He had broken his arm, and I said, would you mind sitting in the waiting room for a few minutes? I'll talk to your son, and I played a game with his son, and um, he, I asked him, so what's going on? You know, What are you worried about? And he said, well, I'm worried about daddy because he doesn't have occupation. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, he doesn't go to work anymore. So then I asked the boy to go in the waiting room and I talked to the parents and it turned out that the father had broken his arm. Uh, he was a tennis player, professional, and, um, and he had to leave from work. And he said, what does my broken arm have to do with my son's ADHD? And um, I said, well, why don't we try just reassuring your son, take him to where you work, tell him daddy's gonna be fine tell them the doctor said everything was fine, and let's see what happens. And they came back two weeks later, and the boy didn't have any more signs of ADHD. Wow, that's amazing. So Dr. Wedge, unfortunately, the way uh, family therapy has been constructed is it doesn't fall within insurance coverages in most cases. For the single mom that's in a, a, a tight financial situation, Give us some recommendations on how to parent their child without, you know, there, there's not much support group. If you don't have that mother-in-law or that grandmother that can look after the child, give us, give us some techniques on how to um, have a positive impact in that child's life. Well, if they can feed their child healthy foods. They can start with that. A healthy diet of fresh foods, fresh fruits and vegetables, n uh, not packaged foods, nothing with artificial food dyes, uh, energy drinks, for example, um, no artificial food colorings. Um, if they give their kids um, healthy, fresh foods, take them to the farmer's market. Let, let the child look at all the different fruits and vegetables at the farmer's market and say, you know, we're going to cook this and we're going to cook that. And um, that's one thing. Removing screen time, giving the child other things to do, like some colored pencils and paper and um, encouraging the child to draw, or finger paints, encouraging the child to finger paint. Um, and then you can have play dates with other parents where you're at the park with the other parent and their child, and that's very helpful. I, I know when my husband used to travel, um, I used to get together with other mothers and we'd go to the park and we'd have our dinner there and, and the kids would all play. And that's very supportive and, and takes the pressure off um, single parenting. 
Dr. Wedge, how, how can we find some of your, your research? I know you're a contributor to psychology today. You know, out of the, the books you've written, which one has been the best-selling book? I think A Disease Called Childhood, Why ADHD uh, Became an American ep- Epidemic. I think that one has done very well. And in that book, I know you cite a lot of peer-reviewed white papers and so forth, but do you also provide solutions that you see in that book? Yeah, sure. I I have a whole chapter on parenting solutions, uh, things I've touched on before, like consistent discipline, uh, parents not arguing in front of the child, not giving the child negative messages, like if a parent has an illness, to shield the child a little bit from that. But they're watching. They're watching. So show them your best face. If you're going to have an argument, wait till they're in bed, go into the garage, in the car, close the windows and have your arguments. But don't have it in front of the children. So verbal verbal confrontation is detrimental as in as much as you're an anti-spanking. You you believe spanking is an archaic method of disciplining children. It doesn't work. Our yeah. Parents have told me that, that it just doesn't work. Do you think that with limited screen time, we'll be able to curb these, these virtual autistic numbers? Do you believe that that will be a, a, a direct curving of those, those high rates? Well, that follows from the research I've seen that um, if you remove the screens, uh, then the child gets better. The symptoms go away after a time. But you have to really remove them. You have to make sure that the child is not uh, using another kid's uh, screen um, if they have a play date or something like that. Uh, you have to really remove the screens and a lot of parent social interaction with the child. Right. And we can't wait for your documentary uh, film on virtual autism to come out. When do you anticipate that'll be finished? I think A Stone Unturned will probably come out in the spring of 24. 24- 24. And will it will it go will it have reenactments in it or will it go into you know uh, vignettes of different psychologists? Well, it has um, vignettes with experts from around the world, from France, Romania, and so forth. And it also has parents and their children um, and telling their story of how their child was diagnosed with autism or ASD and how they cured basically their child by removing screens and a lot of social interaction. Mm -hmm. So it's both parents and experts in the field. Very cool. We'll look forward to that. And how can our audience reach out to you? Are you online? Do you have a big social media presence? Um, I uh, I have a website, MarilynWedgePhD.com. I I have a blog on psychology today, which I think will be very helpful to parents to read my articles. It's free. You just go to psychologytoday.com and look up bloggers, and I'm there. And I have articles on um, autism, on ADHD, on all sorts of child problems. Okay, great. That's a really nice resource to have. Thank you for doing that. And we'll put that link in the description. Dr. Marilyn Wedge, thank you so much for coming by today. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you.